Welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Beal. I'm on the board of directors of KHOI. I am delighted to introduce our general manager, Ursula Rudenberg, who will introduce our guests for the evening. Thank you, Mr. Beal. I met Mr. Johnson for the first time in Iowa City back in 2007 when the FCC opened up a filing window or was going to, and myself and a few other media activists asked Mr. Johnson whether he would lend his name to the effort to get word out to community groups all over the country to encourage them to apply for licenses. And we did a radio show with Mr. Johnson, and he was wonderful. He, he really kind of led the, 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 the cry for citizens to go out there and get radio licenses. KHY was one of those that actually did it and succeeded. And it's a great honor. Mr. Johnson's the perfect person right now to be speaking to us about the situation of media in the current political environment. He was an FCC commissioner from 1966 until 1973, where he really made a name for himself by following the philosophy that it was his role as a government official to speak out on behalf of creative freedom. He not only defended independent and local media, he also defended people in the music business and found himself on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine for his efforts. He has been a champion for creative thinkers from the beginning of his career as a young, I guess as a young Iowan who went to Washington, D.C. and has used his position of influence and power to really speak for independent media and for folks like us who are trying to make a go at it locally. He's had a long career. He has practiced law. He has been a professor in many parts of the world. He ran for Congress once. He held three presidential positions and eventually returned from Washington, D.C. to Iowa to teach at the University of Iowa. He retired. He was teaching cyber law and communications. His blog is from D.C. to Iowa at blogspot.com, and the two is a, is a number two, from D.C. to Iowa. He also does have a, a very educational website, which is a resource, uh, nicholasjohnson.org. One of his better-known books written earlier was How to Talk Back to Your Television Set. Recently, he wrote Columns of Democracy. And in the area of TV, I think many of us remember him as the person who really championed community access TV. So it's really a great honor and uh, with a sense of, by now, uh, gratitude and friendship that I would like to introduce Mr. Nicholas Johnson. Thank you for coming from Iowa City. All right. Thank you all for showing up. I really appreciate it. There are a lot more interesting things you could have done this evening, and uh, I appreciate your taking a chance on me. And coming to the support of KHOI, which is why we're all here tonight, I've made some contributions, and uh, many of you have. Keep this very important institution going. That's what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to put it in context. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Media Under Siege. But what I really want to do is I want to put KHOI in a context. So five months ago, in June, you may recall there were five journalists assassinated in their newsroom outside of Annapolis, Maryland at the Capitol uh, Gazette. And then just last month, October 2nd, Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi journalist working for the Washington Post, was brutally assassinated in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. But sadly, these six folks are only a tiny percentage of the 1,000 journalists who've been assassinated during the last 10 to 15 years. So you want to talk about under siege, I think that's about as under siege as you can be. And I'm not counting the ones who, because they were covering wars, got shot on the battlefield. I'm talking about people who were deliberately found and killed because of what they were writing. And I think, if nothing else, that ought to impress upon you the significance of media in democracies and its significance in totalitarian dictatorships. And that's what I'm really going to talk about tonight. But the media are under siege from a variety of other directions as well. Newspapers are now operating with about half 
of the number of subscribers they had not that long ago, about half the advertising revenue that they've had. And when you've got that problem, you've got to look to cost centers, and you look in a newspaper office, it's reporters, and you start laying off reporters, you've got major institutions that are not covered. Uh, our local county commissioner complained that nobody from any <laughs> news organization ever comes to county board of supervisors meetings. So in addition to those problems and the television stations that used to make 100% return per year on depreciated capital because they could count on getting one-third of the people watching TV were going to watch one of the three network affiliates, now they've got 500 channels that they're competing with. Plus another problem I'll come to in a moment. Because the competition here is really for eyeballs. The television business is not about selling programs. It's about selling you, the audience, to the advertiser, who is the consumer. The advertiser is the consumer. Comes to the broadcaster and buys your, your eyeballs. Well, if your eyeballs aren't there, that becomes a very serious problem. And that's what's uh, happened, because every hour that we spend staring at a laptop or a smartphone texting our friends or checking our Facebook account or whatever are hours that we are not spending looking at a newspaper or looking at a television set. I'm informed that there are some people who actually, oh, they tend to their gardens or they go for a walk in the woods or something like that without any electronic devices. I've I've never seen one of these people, and I have some real questions as to whether or not they exist. But I know in Iowa City, you've got to be careful not to get run over by somebody who's walking. Or Here in Ames, I saw a woman tonight riding her bicycle while she was looking at her, her phone with, the other, you know, with one hand while she's looking at her phone with the other, other hand. So I think people who are not doing this are a uh, very minuscule percentage of all of us. Finally... Among the first institutions to come under attack in the 49 dictatorships, authoritarians, whatever you want to call them around the world, there are now 49 countries. This is increasing. There is pressure from these folks to turn other democracies into dictatorships. But they've already uh, brought it up to 49. A couple Sundays ago, we added Brazil to that list. And what do they do with regard to the media? Well, they have massive propaganda efforts. They get in and revise the school books in the schools. Sometimes the owners actually own the newspapers, magazines, and television stations, which was the case when the State Department sent me to Kazakhstan. They punish uh, journalists and publishers, sometimes, as I've noted, with assassination. They try to reduce the public's trust in the media because the media, like the judiciary, is a check, deliberately a check, on abuses by executives, by leaders. And so they, uh, they need to reduce the public's trust in the media. And sometimes they block citizen access to external shortwave signals back in my childhood, or internet sites that people in the country can't reach, publications that can't be imported, and so forth. So that's how the media is under siege. All right, so now we want to provide a little context. Because the media is not the only institution that's under siege right now. In fact, this may sound shocking, but I think our democracy may well not survive the attacks upon it from home and abroad right now. I'll repeat that. I think it's possible that our democracy will not survive. That's a reality that I think we've got to deal with. Take this seriously. I'm not here just to entertain you tonight. And like climate change, there comes a time, there comes a red line when you cross it 
when the life of a democracy, or indeed human life on Earth, can no longer be resuscitated. We've already lost lots of endangered species. Well, we're just another species, let me remind you. Like a good marriage, a good democracy is something we have to work at. An apocryphal story is told of a pole in a community. They went around and they asked people, what do you think is the worst problem in our community? Is it ignorance or apathy? Plurality response was, ignorance or apathy? Ah, I don't know and I don't care. Well, a democracy requires people who do know and do care have access to the accurate and relevant facts that they need and the education to understand them and the interest and energy and motivation to act accordingly and to fulfill the responsibility that a democracy puts on each of us as individuals. When uh, kids used to come home after school, they'd ask uh, Mary, my wife, they'd say, Mom, make me a sandwich. And she would dutifully put her hand on their head and wave and say, you are a sandwich. Well, it's unfortunate, but the preservation of a democracy is even more difficult than turning a child into a sandwich. And yet the destruction of a democracy can occur almost as quickly as you can turn a sandwich into a child. I don't know exactly what that means either, but I, <laughs> I thought it was kind of good. Most democracies do not become dictatorships because of some uh, military invasion, let alone invasions from Central America of uh, people looking for relief. Most come from internal defection. Leaders who use the very rights that democracies make possible. We like to say that, well, it can't happen here. Well, let me tell you, it's already happened here. Back in February 20th of 1939, 20,000 Americans filled Madison Square Garden, dressed as Nazis, with arms upraised in the Nazi salute, and cheering as their speaker called for a, quote, white, Gentile-ruled United States. Only three weeks ago tomorrow, an anti-Semite with an AR-15 turned the Tree of Life synagogue into a tree of death for 11 Jews in Pittsburgh's Squirrel Hill. Reports of hate crimes are markedly up from what they have been to now annually 7,100 a year. That's reality. That's where we are right now. The question is, which direction are we going to move? You can't buy democracy in a store. You can't pass a law and create a democracy. There are only nations and their peoples whose institutions make democracy possible. And those institutions are to a democracy what the pillars or the pilings underneath one of those beach houses right there on the ocean has to protect them from the storm surge uh, coming from the ocean. They're up above it, they're supported. That's what these institutions do. What am I talking about? One is education, which you know in Ames and I know in Iowa City. Well-funded, free, K-12 education, and, as the major democracies in the world have, free higher education, including, incidentally, for Americans. If you want to go study at some of the world's greatest uh, universities, they'll provide you an education tuition free because it makes economic sense for them to do it. You can't even sell this to people who are trying to boost our economy. 
Libraries, free public libraries for those who have the education and are able to use them. These are the institutions that support a democracy. Courts, a respected, independent judiciary willing to stand up to the leader's abuses. Voting, legislators representing constituents' interests, not special interests, elected with voting systems that encourage citizen participation rather than discourage with voter suppression schemes. These are among what I have called the columns of democracy, as I have titled the book. If those institutions are supported and adequately funded and respected and encouraged, well, then democracy is possible. It's not inevitable, but it's at least possible. But when they are damaged and destroyed, democracy collapses. Just like that beach house when its pillars are knocked down from under it. Now, all of these institutions are essential to democracy, but communication and the media were thought to be central by our founders and remain so today. As President uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said, were it left to me to, to decide whether we should have governments without newspapers or newspapers without governments, I should never hesitate to choose the latter. That's how important he thought it was. And he continued, but I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. Look at what he did with just two sentences. He made the case for the First Amendment, free public education, and universal postal delivery of books, magazines, and newspapers at subsidized rates. He made no mention of having been president of the United States on his tombstone. Didn't have a lot of space, but he didn't think that was the most important. What he wanted to be remembered for was, quote, father of the University of Virginia. We've had free public schools in this country since Boston Latin in 1635, a central purpose of which of these schools and of those one-room schoolhouses, 12,000 of them here in Iowa, was always civics, that the schools existed to turn young Americans into citizens capable of participating in our democracy. Jefferson also saw the value of libraries, and when the Library of Congress burned in 1814, he decided to give his own personal library, which was twice the size of the former library of the Library of Congress, at 6,500 volumes. Uh, he decided to give that uh, to what then became today's Library of, of Congress. But look at the other things we've done to encourage communication you may not think of in that context. In addition to the postal system with its Pony Express, we subsidized canals and railroads. We had universal telephone service with long distance subsidizing the local phone that everybody uh, could have at radically reduced uh, rates. Today we are dealing with broadband access to the internet and trying to get it out geographically as well as in our largest urban centers. The subsidization of the airlines, the interstate highway system, all these things were at least in part an effort to facilitate more and better communication. The 19 minute ABC World News Tonight contains little world news and even less of the information citizens need. It deliberately attracts an audience that apparently likes to be frightened, even terrorized, by an excited anchor person's dramatic portrayals of the day's worst disasters and dangers, some of which aren't even legitimate local news where they occurred. Storms are deadly. The driver was trapped in her car. The school buses were involved in tragedies. There was a scare at sea when a cruise ship listed a little. 
There are deadly airline and highway accidents, shootings and stabbings, fires and floods, explosions and hurricanes. 19 minutes worth every night. So merely to have media is not quite enough. Just because you have media doesn't mean that it contains information of use to a democracy. ABC comes a lot closer to what Patty Chayefsky predicted as the future of news in the movie network. It's nothing like the CBS News with Walter Cronkite, and nothing probably will be in the future. It's particularly important with regard to KHOI to distinguish between international, national, state, and local news. I've got probably two dozen foreign uh, newspapers and broadcasters as apps on my iPhone. The Guardian in London, Le Monde in Paris, Erbil, Doha, South China Morning Post, uh, Sai Evening Shimbun, uh, China Daily, India Times from Mumbai. That, that's out there. I'm not saying that's enough. I'm saying that if you want to know what's going on in other places in the world, Ruda is one of my favorites. It's a news service from Kurdistan, news you're never going to get anywhere else. National news, we can get apps for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, whatever. State news, not quite as good as it used to be. The Des Moines Register used to legitimately say it was the newspaper all Iowa depends upon because it was. They had trucks delivering the papers around the state. You could find one on the counter at every cafe in a small town in Iowa. That's no longer the case. They still serve central part of Iowa, and the Gazette over in eastern Iowa does a good job of state news. But we don't have what we once had covering the legislature, let alone all the departments and agencies of the state government. All of which brings us to local news. Because if you want to know the arguments for and against the new water plant, people who died and the people who opened new business, what roads are closed for construction, uh, what's happening with the property taxes, the results of your latest local school board election, Iowans aren't going to find either the New York Times or the Des Moines Register of much help. Uh, you're going to have to rely on uh, local news sources. Television radio stations have what they call their ADI, the Area of Dominant Influence. Uh, newspapers have their circulation area. And when you think about it, for most practical, realistic purposes, that area defines our community because within it we share that source of information from the newspaper, from the television station. We may not be aware of it. We may not even know where the boundary is. But for our day-to-day -day lives, it's more important than whatever the city limits may be. So think about the number of words that begin with C-O-M-M. -M. You know, there's, uh, of course, commune, the commons, communal, communitarian. But also community and communication. Because community is the essential chemical ingredient that makes a democracy. And that's right here. It's with those of you gathered here this evening. It's with a church congregation. It's with a civic uh, organization. It's with a neighborhood. It's with the K-12 school and the students and the parents and the teachers who are associated with it. Those are our, our community. Tennessee, California, most of the civilized nation in the world provide the equivalent of a community college training tuition free to anybody who's capable of benefiting from it. Why don't we? We decided over 100 years ago that eight years of schooling was not enough. We should have K-12, not one through eight. Now, after 100 years, do you really think it's an outrageous proposal to suggest that we might expand that from K-12 to K-14? I don't think so. And then maybe we could fill some of these jobs. And then maybe we could attract some of these companies that we pay $100 million to come to Iowa, and they'd come anyway because we got the workers for them. When Benjamin Franklin was leaving the Constitutional Convention, a stranger asked him, what kind of government are you giving us? A republic or a monarchy? 
And he is said to have replied, a republic, if you can keep it. That's the issue. Can we keep it? For 230 years we have, the United States is at 55% of the people who could register and vote actually vote. There are eight countries that uh, are above 75%. Belgium is at 87%. We are 26th. Go down the list a long way before you see the United States. Can we keep it? For 230 years we have, we've had our challenges, slavery, civil war, the Great Depression, World War II in a way put some real stress on us. But it's, it, our democracy has never before been threatened with extinction. Now that's a possibility. We can no longer take it for granted as I was able to with, throughout my youth. No longer assure our grandchildren that America's democracy will forever survive. Whether it does continue is up to us, you and me. How much we are willing to do, and not incidentally, what you do with KHOI. You can participate more in the media that exists in this community, including KHOI, which can be an important column of democracy, and thereby make an additional contribution to maintaining our democracy in this community, and thereby throughout the state and the country. You've been listening to a speech that was delivered by former FCC Commissioner Nicholas Johnson at the First United Methodist Church in Ames, Iowa, on November 16th. Mr. Johnson served on the Federal Communications Commission from 1966 to 1973 when he championed independent media by advocating for citizen participation at the FCC for public access cable channels and for community radio stations. Mr. Johnson had a distinguished career in Washington, D.C. with three presidential appointments and hosting various public broadcasting TV shows. Mr. Johnson was speaking as a benefit for KHOI, independent community radio station.